right. Well, welcome, everybody. We are so delighted and excited to have all of you here with us for our sixth installment of Theology Thursdays. We have an esteemed guest with us today, Matthias Roberts, who is an author. He is uh, an engager in critical thinking around what does it mean to be a person of faith in the 21st century? How do we incorporate our entire self and embodied self into the worship of God and the following of Jesus? Uh, we are truly honored that he has come and he's actually come by way of a personal connection with one of our members, uh, James South, who's actually the moderator of Admiral Church. So without further ado, I'd like to just turn it over to Matthias to uh, lead us through today's uh, consideration of what is a queer theology? Thank you, Matthias. Well, thank you. I, I am thrilled to be here. It's, it's lovely to see friendly faces on the screen. Um, I, I would love it if, if each of you, so I, I want today to be somewhat interactional to a point, so, so don't panic. <laughs> but, but if you can use the chat feature, um, I, I'm gonna ha have some questions for us to kind of engage with and, and answer. Um, so to kind of ease us into that, would love it if you could just, you know, put your name, your pronouns, I use he, him pronouns, and where you're coming from. I'm assuming most of us are in Seattle, but maybe what neighborhood you're in, um, just to get used to using um, the, the chat. And so I can kind of get to know you and feel like I, kn I know some of who I'm talking to. Um, so again, thank you so much for having me. Uh, today I'm going to be talking a little bit around the question of what is a queer theology? Uh, and this is a really interesting question to me. Um, Any time I talk about theology, I feel a little bit of panic rise in me. <laughs> like it's this feeling of, oh my goodness, am I supposed to know this? Am I supposed to have this just down pat, ready to present, ready to say to you all, okay, get out your notebooks and, and write this down. Here is the answer. And maybe there is someone out there who can stand up here and do that, um, but I'm not that person. So, so I'll tell you right now, if you're coming to this talk, hoping that I'm going to give you an answer or give you some kind of queer theological system, uh, I, I'm so sorry, it's not gonna happen. Um, and, and every talk that I've been giving in the last few months, whether it's been about purity culture or sexual ethics or theology, I, I've started with similar words, culminating in this actual confession. I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I am not quite sure what a queer theology is. I, I'm going to give you some ideas here in the moment, so, so hopefully this isn't all a wash. But that place of, I don't know, feels really like a, a really important starting point. And I don't say that to denigrate the years of work I've put into this space. Um, but the interesting thing to me is the more years I put into this space, the less I feel like I know. I, I know we're all at a church here and maybe you've had that experience too. That, that sense of the more I study, the less I feel like I know. And maybe not. I know a lot of churches don't really like those I don't know spaces, um, but, but I do have a feeling that this isn't that kind of church, simply by the nature of me being here today. <laughs> so if I'm wrong about that, I mean, let's blow some things up, but, but I, don't, I, don't, I mean, I see you all nodding your head. So. <laughs> uh, so, so I'm not here to impart some kind of knowledge here, but, but instead I want to invite you into a space of imagining with me sharing ideas. Uh, I, I kind of wish we were all around a fireplace and I could ask each of you, what do you think? What do you think a queer theology is? What do you think theology itself is? Because I bet you have some ideas. Maybe they're barely even half formed. Um, but then we could take all of our barely half formed ideas and combine them into a conversation. And, and that's what I wish this could be. And, and I'm gonna try, like I hinted, we're, we're gonna try to do some interaction. Um, although we aren't all in the same room, we aren't around a fireplace. I, I do hope that we can try to have that kind of conversation and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. So that's my starting point, I don't know. Uh, I, I have another starting point too. 
And that second starting point is the idea that there is no such thing as theology in a singular sense. We are in a world of theologies, plural. I'm sure you've run into this before, even tacitly, this wide, wide world of theological ideas that are out there. There, there are many different theologies. And I imagine many of us here are actively working to combat some of those theologies, especially going to a church like that. You may hear my dog in the background. I don't know if you can hear that, but she's you know, enjoying her afternoon. Um, so I believe the same thing about queer theology. There is no singular queer theology. There are queer theologies. And, and why is that? Because I believe we can't separate the work of theology from our lived experience, from our bodies, from our particularity. Uh, I, I am not the first to say this. Uh, womanist theologians, black and brown women have been saying this for years and years. Theology cannot be separated from our lives. Therefore, each of us have a theology and each of us carry that theology into the world. So even if we find ourselves existing in worlds where white men stand on stages and attempt to tell us the one right theology, we each internalize that in different ways. That, and, and here the sarcasm and quotation marks well here, that one right theology turns into multiple theologies the moment it is taken in by multiple different people. Each person with different ideas making different meanings. And that's the first point that I believe a queer theology might invite us into. Naming and recognizing that theology is an ever-moving, ever-expanding, ever-evolving thing. So let's think about this from a lens of queerness. Our understandings of queerness are so incredibly different from where they were 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 100 years ago. Our understandings of gender and sexuality are so different. So, so think about your own lives the evolution you have been through in understanding yourself. I, I doubt anyone in this room would say, I understand myself the very same way that I did five years ago. A, a queer theology, I think, might invite us into centering this reality, not pretending it isn't true. And recognize, I'm talking about theology right now, not about God. We're going to get to God in a moment, but, but theology as a purely human endeavor, our attempts to wrap our minds around this idea of God, the divine. And, and I think we see it in scripture, in an evolving understanding of God. Now, I didn't, I didn't grow up with that idea, that, that idea that scripture might actually show us different understandings of God throughout history. I was taught that the way that Moses and Abraham understood God is the very exact same way that Jesus understood God. That our understandings of God don't grow, don't evolve. That the Old Testament and the New Testament show us different faces of the way God is. Instead of showing us the different ways humans understood God throughout history. So the, the evolution from, under, from understanding God as one who requires vengeance and sacrifice to a God who is loving and who doesn't want sacrifice at all. Uh, so, so this idea that we all contain a theology within us, an understanding of God within us, is something that seems a little bit queer to me, does it not? That, that maybe the work of theology is a community-based activity where we can all bring our ideas to the table and play with them together. So, so I want to try something with you all. It, it might be super awkward. <laughs> it may not work, um, but I'm a therapist. I am just fine with awkwardness. I'm just fine with sitting in silence. So I, I am wondering, don't start typing yet, but I'm wondering if you would answer this question in the comments. I'm going to give a few more instructions here in a second. But the question is, what do you know about God? based out of your own queer experience. 
So before you start typing some clarification, because I know this question might be a little bit startling for some of you who don't identify as queer. You may be settling back to read the comments, but I, but I want you to participate too. Because by queer here, I don't mean just those of us who are sexually queer. I mean something far more broad. So, so to borrow some words from the Reverend Elizabeth Edmund, who wrote in her book, Queer Virtue, that queerness is something that has at its center an impulse to disrupt any and all efforts to reduce into simplistic dualism our experience of life and God. Uh, she continues that queering as an impulse and lens has been applied to countless human perceptions and academic disciplines from architecture to biology to linguistics and theology. Uh, it's not a stretch to see how Jesus ruptured these dualisms, these binaries all the time, life and death human and divine, sacred and profane. Even Paul's insistence that in Christ there is, no, there is neither male nor female, uh, that is the essence of queering. And that's set in the midst of a passage that also queers the lines between Jew and Greek, slave and free. So, so, so I want you to answer this question in a particular kind of way. I'm not looking for Sunday school answers. I'm not looking for you to quote scripture. I'm not looking for some kind of defensive apologetic. I want you to tap into your places of knowing what you know of strangeness, of difference. What do you know about God based on your own queer experience? You can type that out in the chat. <laughs> and here's the part that might be a little bit awkward. I am going to stop talking for two minutes. So you have a choice here. Uh, you can sit here and stare at me for these two minutes. And if you want to do that, I'm just fine with that. Uh, there's, there's no requirement. Sitting and staring at me for two minutes is a good use of your time. Um, but if you don't want to just sit here in silence and st stare at each other, uh, then, then use that time to type out an answer in the chat. So two minutes. What do you know about God from your own queer experience? And I will read some of these responses. Uh, I know that I have and will always have an incomplete understanding of God. God is both so familiar and so beyond words. I am made in God's image, and when I didn't have words for my own queerness, that didn't make me any less queer or the image of God in me any less queer. Yes. I have come to love God for embracing every single individual for the individual that each one is. Nobody should be like someone else because, because God loves unconditionally. Yeah. God is so much more than dual. She, he, they is so much more than I can grasp. So many more dimensions. I know in my heart that we are all beloved by God, that all are created in their image, that through faith we are set free, that all are accepted and loved and treasured. Yes, thank you. It's the two minute mark. If you're typing, please continue to feel free to, to type and, and answer, we'll see them. But, but I hope you can see that we already have the beginnings of a queer theology right here. Um, I, I see this dualities are the parts, this is in the chat of the limits created by humans, whereas God transcends the binary duality, yes. Um, th that's all theology is at its core. The human ideas about God are attempts to grasp at and understand the divine. 
And, and, and sure, I mean, we have tools for that, right? We, we have what one theologian, John Wesley, who ended up founding an entire movement, named us some tools, scripture, reason, experience, and tradition, the Wesleyan quadrilateral. But, but here's what I'm trying to argue right from the start. We can't divorce our readings of scripture, the forming of the ways we reason, the traditions we uphold, and the experiences we have had from the very particularity of who we are as people. So I, I believe a queer theology will center that truth. Instead of centering a white heteronormative idea that theologians can only be white men who have been trained in a very specific way. That, that idea isn't just rooted in heteronormativity. It is rooted in white supremacy. So there's a both and here. Because, of course, I believe that education and training is important. Uh, but we can't prize it as the end-all, be-all, because if only formally educated people are doing theology, then that theology isn't going to work for the thousands who don't have access to these things. We each are bringing something to the table. And that brings me to this second idea I want to talk about this afternoon, and that is the nature of queerness. Now, queer is one of those words that has many different meanings by definition. Uh, so, so here's another prompt. We're, we're not going to sit here in silence for three minutes, but, but I would like you to type in the chat how you understand the word queer. It's a hard question to answer. I have a hard time answering this question too. But roughly, what does it mean? What does it mean to queer something? How do you understand this word? Um, and I'll, I'll read a few of the responses. beyond binary, deeper than definitions, yes. And I've always believed that God exists in everyone and have always struggled that with any the theology that doesn't see God in everyone, yes. Uh, queer not fitting into a neat category, yes. Out of the normal, different, not bad, but different. Uh, also means to, to square up as a verb. Uh, not classically heterosexual. It's a reaction against the older understanding of an aggressive derogatory meaning, yes. We're going to talk about that in a moment. So, so it actively welcomes uniqueness, yes queer theology to read ourselves into the stories because queer folks have always existed and therefore must be in the stories. Yes. Yes. So, so I want to expand a little bit more on the work of Reverend Elizabeth Ed Edmund, who, who I mentioned earlier. Uh, so she claims in her book, Queer Virtue, that Christianity itself is inherently liminal, inherently queer. And she argues that queer people are uniquely positioned to understand some of those queer dynamics within the faith tradition. So she writes about three distinct truth claims of Christianity. One, that God came to earth in the person of Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ was killed, died, and rose from the dead, and that it is possible for any human being to perceive these truths and join or form a community that worships this God following the ethical path laid out by Jesus. So, so those were the, th the three. I, I just said one, but <laughs> Jesus Christ was killed, died, and rose from the dead. Two. Um, oh, I didn't write these numbers into mine, but anyway, I'm, I'm so sorry. <laughs> but, but these three things, that God came to the earth in the form of Jesus Christ, the person of Jesus Christ, that Christ was killed, died, and rose from the dead, and that it's possible for us as humans to perceive these truths and, and join into community around these truths. Um, she, she argues that these claims just dramatically and decisively rupture binaries that previously were thought to be fundamental truths. The binary of God and humanity, the binary of life and death, the binaries of religious boundaries. So God, for Reverend Edmund, is in the very business of rupturing boundaries. 
And that's why she claims authentic Christianity is and must be queer. So I, I want to take this idea of Edmonds and run with it. If this faith tradition is inherently queer, then might it be that embodying queerness in ourselves, our bodies, and in the way we move in the world, might queerness truly be a gift? A gift of having the non-binary nature of the spiritual realm exist within us. Uh, my mom growing up would occasionally use the word queer around the house in its most basic usage to describe something that was a little bit odd. It, it never had a negative connotation to me growing up until I turned 13. And, and when I turned 13, I joined the Boy Scouts. Uh, and I was, I was so excited to join. Uh, my troop did these monthly campouts with lessons on, you know, learning how to tie knots, how to make fires, how to survive in the wilderness. Um, and, and because my parents literally met in the woods while working as wilderness guides, a love of the outdoors had, had been bred kind of into me. So my scout troop met every Tuesday night. And upon joining the troop, I realized that maybe my dreams of becoming the next master outdoorsman might be thwarted by the guys in my troop who immediately noticed my somewhat quiet, effeminate nature and labeled me as gay. And, and, and to cope with the bullying that began to happen every Tuesday night, I convinced my best friend to join. We would wander off during the social time and, and join one or two other more quiet guys, ignoring the scorn that came from the rest of the troop. We, we had some solidarity. And one night my friend and I were walking back into the meeting space when one of the older boys came up to us and asked, what do you guys do over there? What are you, a bunch of queers? And I was taken aback because I knew exactly what he was asking, but had never heard queer used before to talk about sexuality. We shot back, no, uh, uncomfortably, and, and we beelined to our chairs at the side of the, the room. But the word confused me. It, it obviously confused my friend too, who, who later in the car asked his mom what it meant. And she got defensive really fast. Who, who's calling you that? And within a couple of weeks, my, my friend was no longer allowed to come to Boy Scouts. And I started begging my parents to let me quit too. And a, a few months later, they caved. But that word stuck, queer. It, it had a really slimy quality to it. And, and I didn't hear it again for years because when I was growing up, gay was the more preferred slur. But it scared me. What if they were right? What if I really was queer? And, and deep down, I knew that they weren't very far away from the truth. So, so, so I can't imagine what that scared 13-year-old boy would think if I were to go back in time and, and tell him, don't, don't worry about it. Soon you'll be kissing men and have a podcast called Queerology. Um, queer had a negative meaning for me. It was a bad word. And throughout history, it has had times where it has both been a slur, a pretty major slur, and a self-chosen term of identity. And to this day, there are many within the generations above me in the LGBTQ community who really dislike this word because of the great harm it represented. So I, I, I want to acknowledge that even in this talk and, and honor the harm um, and bemoan the limits of language because, because the word queer in its contemporary usage is the only word that I know of which expresses the binary breaking quality. And it's difficult when language changes amongst generations. And, and so I believe that queer is possibly the best word that we have to fully encompass the gender and sexual variations that existed within our world. Uh, but there's debate on that. And it has even broader meaning than that. So. So th there's a lot of power in taking back a word that was once meant to break us down, to hurt us, to categorize us. And for us to say as LGBTQ people, uh, in, in the words of the drag queen Bianca Del Rio, not today, Satan. What was meant for harm has become good. And, and I will stand here and declare that queerness is good.
I'll even go so far as saying I believe it's a spiritual gift, a gift that many of us have. And so when we talk about querying something, we mean breaking it out of its box. We take it and we play with it. There's a little bit of fun thrown into the mix, a little bit of gravity as well. This is holy work. And if we truly believe that God or the divine cannot be boxed, cannot be contained, cannot be placed into binary or easy categories, then by that definition, God is queer. Each and every one of us exists in a world which tells us to prod and push and fit ourselves into boxes. And I think many of us still have those voices which exist inside of us, the voices that say, hey, maybe tone it down a little bit. And I wanna to speak to those voices right now. What if this very thing, and I'm speaking to the, to the, the people who identify as LGBTQ right now, what if this very thing that has caused us so much pain, this thing which causes us to stand out in a room this, this thing that so many tell us has disqualified us from the family of God. What if this thing is divinely ordained and is a gift? What if our queerness in some weird, inexplicable way is a very piece of the divine nature? What if embracing our queerness is embracing the nature of God? So when I was working on my master's degree in counseling psychology, I had a professor who, despite being a fairly well-known teacher about sexuality within the conservative Christian world, uh, he would constantly tell us, the moment you try to put a label on your sexuality, that's the moment your sexuality is going to surprise you. And, and, and he would stand at the front of the classroom and say, everyone, yes, everyone is bisexual. Uh, in other words, everyone is queer. And, and the first time I heard this, I looked at him and scoffed. Not me, I thought. <laughs> I am gay. <laughs> I am solidly a six on the Kinsey scale, 100% gay. Uh, and, and yet, as I've continued to do my own work, and as I have begun to soften some of the labels I put around myself for protection, I've, I've realized in some ways that my professor is right. And so I'm, I'm not come, I'm not standing here to like come out to you as bisexual. I'm still pretty gay, but it, but it raises an interesting point. I, I've had my professor's words confirmed again and again in my subsequent work as a therapist, and, and I've come to believe the truth of them. Everyone is queer. I, I don't believe that there is such a thing as exclusively homosexual or exclusively straight. Just like the medical community is beginning to discover that there is no such thing as exclusively male or exclusively female. But here's the catch. Not everyone embraces their queerness. We like our boxes, our labels, our categories. They make us feel safe and protected, and they help us identify with certain groups and ways of being they're nice. In some ways, they're easy. I, I say this because I would imagine there are some straight people in this room wondering, what about me? And I say to you the same thing that I'm saying to us queer people. I'm asking us to do the work of paying attention to our own queerness, to the ways our very selves defy and transcend the labels we place upon them in a similar way to how God cannot be placed in a box, neither can we. So as we do this work in our own lives, the, the better prepared we become to walk out into the world and use it there as well. So, so straight folks, how can you pay attention to the ways that queerness, speaking broadly, manifests within you? In queer people, how can we pay attention to the ways our identities break out of the boxes that even we put on ourselves? <sighs> so I, I want to invite us into this conversation again, and I'm going to pause again this time. Given everything that I've just talked about, 
I, I want you to answer the following question, and it's a really similar question as the one I started with, but what does it mean to queer theology? To you, what does it mean to queer theology? There are no wrong answers here, but um, and I'm gonna pause for two minutes and, and we'll read some of these, these answers. to break everyone out of their defined boxes and understanding of the love of God. Uh, theology is a big word. Queer is an emotionally charged word. It's hard to put them together, yeah. To mix it up, challenge, move outside the rigid boxes of mainstream white male-centered theology so all can see the magnificent love of God. How can I pay attention to queerness in myself? Um, Rebecca says the, the, she doesn't talk about it often in a lot of circles because people see it as an invitation to question your relationship with your male partner. Yes, that's huge. But to pay attention to it is to make space for it, to let the queer kid in my youth group know that they are whole, beloved, and belong. Yes. To recognize that the belovedness in all of us. Yes. So remember, I started off today telling you all that I'm not going to give you answers because here's the deal. You, you may have picked up on this already in, in what I've been talking about, but, but if not, I, I want to make it clear. I believe that queerness also breaks the binary of certainty and uncertainty. It, it calls us into a space, a liminal space in between where we can know and not know and keep discovering and keep learning what we don't know. And it's a place for an exchange of ideas within community. So I, I want to end with something another theologian once told me, uh, Dr. James Allison. Uh, he's an out gay Catholic priest. And, and a few years ago, I was sitting in a house overlooking Puget Sound down in Tacoma with a small group of people who had gathered to hear Dr. Allison speak. And he began to walk us through human history and talk about the evolution of our understandings of human sexuality and gender. And he walked us through all the way up until this present day and then told us, all of us who are in our 20s and 30s, that my generation is the first generation in all of human history to actually be able to live out what it means to be an out queer person within the community of faith. And of course, there's overlap and wiggle room here. Uh, but, but then he said that the generation below me, uh, the, the folks who are you know going through adolescence right now, they're the first generation, at least here in the United States, in all of human history to go through adolescence in a similar way as our straight counterparts, uh, where they can experience attraction to someone of the, the same gender and express that in a way that is out and open. And, and of course, you know, it depends on where we are in the States too, but as a whole, People who are going through adolescence right now get to experience adolescence at the same time as their straight counterparts. The world has never seen a generation of queer people who have been able to come out and grow up as queer selves from early ages. So we obviously still have a lot of work to do to make that a complete reality. But we, us, those of us in this room, are some of the first people to ever ask these really big questions. 
what is a queer theology? What does it mean to be queer people of faith? And, and I hope you'll walk away from this this afternoon understanding that means you are a theologian. We are theologians. We have the ability to do this work, to ask these big questions and arrive at understandings about God and who we are as people that are different and more inclusive than we have ever seen. So what is a queer theology? I don't know. I have some ideas, but also I want to hear yours and I want us to do that work. May it be so. Thank you. Well, I think at this point, it is wise and good for us to open it up uh, to some questions uh, with Matthias uh, about this presentation, about whatever is sitting on your heart and mind um, as we contemplate what it means to be queer folks uh, and folks queering the nature and the representation, I think probably is more accurate, the representation of God. So I'll just open it up at this point. If anyone has a comment or a question that they'd like to share and bring to the group, um, we could even potentially have a group conversation at this point. Um, but I'd like to first start with, is there any specific questions that folks would like to ask to Matthias about the presentation you've heard so far? Okay, well, I actually have a question. Um, and this is a question that I've been thinking about a lot as I think about things like pride parades and celebrations of queerness and kind of LGBTQ identity. Um, it has been my experience that so often the desire to claim a public identity is often because we experience the existence of oppression in the corporate world, in the public world. And so that desire to claim a sense of pride is almost as a response to the existence of domination systems and oppression systems. And so does that mean in some way that our identities are caught up in the existence of domination systems? Like who we are, how we understand ourselves is inherently defined by the existence of oppression and is there i mean the kingdom of god is a world without that is the kingdom of god a world without identity hmm. Hmm. i mean i, I <laughs> it's a huge question so i, I can take a stab at an answer <laughs> but you're gonna have me thinking about this a lot too it, it, it's interesting uh, on my podcast uh Whenever I talk to people from the United States, uh, I, so I'll back up. The first question I ask everyone on my podcast, which is called Queerology, uh, is how do you identify and how has your faith helped form that identity? So, so that's how I start every conversation with people. When I talk with people from the United States, they answer that question. You know, they give me a list of their identities and they talk about how their faith and you're kind of involved with that. Um, what's been fascinating to me though, is, is when I talk to people from the UK, from Australia, from other places in the world, every single one of them have said, I don't know how I identify. I actually don't like this idea of identifying me. Um, and then they'll talk about how identifying feels um, like they're boxing themselves in. And, and I think that's a really interesting approach because I mean, even as we have this conversation of queer theology and, and breaking of boundaries and, and boxes, um, there is this sense of we only have labels to put us into categories so that we can understand each other. But, but what does it actually look like to not have to have those labels to begin with? I think it's hard for our human minds to, to wrap around that idea of not having labels, identities. But I do wonder if, as we get rid of these systems of, do of domination and oppression, <laughs> whether some of our identity labels will, will go with them. Um, 
I, I don't know. It is a fascinating idea. Yeah. Anybody else? Question, comment? Anne, go ahead. Well, no, I just want to make a comment. Um, I call myself a citizen of the world because it's very limited to be a citizen of one country. I've been Russian, I've been German, I've been Canadian, and now I'm US. So to me, to say I'm a citizen of the world, which is like being queer, because you don't really ever have formed a true identity of any one country. And so to me, it's very easy to move in different societies and different um, um, congregations of peoples. And I don't know, I think it's because I have been so many different things mm -hmm. that it's easier for me than for someone who's had a specific identity their entire life. They are female and this is what females do. This is what girls do. This is what women do. None of the rest of it has any meaning for you. I don't know. Is that a question? Is that a whatever? I, I think it's a brilliant point. <laughs> um, oh. the, the, in, in, it ties even into this, this idea that our particularity, our contexts define who we are, but also who, who we are not. Um, and then what it means to, to, in some ways, escape from those. Mm. I have a question. Um, it's, could you maybe describe what you think um, in terms of theology, where queer theology um, is most challenged by, I don't know what to call it, maybe orthodox theology or the uh, mainstream theology? Like, what are the, um, the points that queer theology um, rubs the most? Yeah, I mean, I imagine there are probably many different ways to answer that that question. And so I'll, I'll answer from my own experience, uh, realizing that there there may be many 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 answers to this. But 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 in my experience, like as I walk into spaces as a queer theologian, the biggest rubbing point still is is that idea of like queer people can't be Christians, can't be theologians can't hold faith and identity together like it, i know in some places seattle is, is one of these places of where a lot of us have kind of moved beyond that conversation but but in many places still in the united states they're incompatible and and, and so that's the first thing that we kind of have to break down is like what is it like does our do our theological systems even have room for difference? It, so, so that would be one place, and, and I'm sure there are many other places where, where things rub against. But I also don't see them as being personally, like what we would call like necessarily like orthodox theology or queer theology. I, I don't see them as being separate from each other. I, I, I see them as being merged, um, and and uh queerness and, and queer people showing us a vision of who god is in god's fullness um which i think is deeply orthodox <laughs> to discover who god is but a, a lot of people do disagree with me on that though too um. just to pursue it just a little bit if you don't mind because i appreciate that um yeah. i'm just kind of wondering because i i don't um I don't think my theological home has this rub, as, as you call it. Sure. Um, so I'm trying to understand um, what is it that um, that would make, um, I don't know what the term is, if it's not orthodox or mainstream or whatever it's called, um, say that 
you don't belong. Uh, I'm what, where's with the theological point? I guess I'm trying to ask, other than just the habit. I mean, is there something about in the in the Bible or the teachings or the doctrine or the history or where does it come from? Yeah, uh, a, a lot of people will there you know, there are six to seven depending on who you're talking to verses in in the Bible that seem to at least on a surface reading, arguably um, condemn homosexuality. And, and a lot of people hold very closely to particular ways of reading those verses. But we can't separate that from a historical picture of the way sexuality has been used as a wedge issue politically. Um, it, it's a really easy way to divide and categorize people, whether you're, you're pro-LGBT marriage or not. I mean, it's a divider and people can get really worked up. And, and so I also see it, you know, as we talk about systems of dominance and power, there are a lot of these systems involved with keeping those particular readings of those six to seven verses a certain way in order to keep people kind of in check or, or part of certain systems. Um, it, it's very political as well, um, in, in my view. That's one of the things that we've actually been talking about as we've been doing Bible study on homosexuality is that it has everything to do with your interpretive lens on the authority of scripture and how you engage with scripture. Because sure, the, there are particular passages that are very specifically anti-male to male sexual interaction, right? It doesn't talk about women because that doesn't have anything to do with uh, the progeny of the nation of Israel. But um, at the same time, there's lots of other commandments and stipulations about how to live one's life that we totally ignore. And there's no condemnation of slavery, for example, in the Hebrew Bible or the New Testament. So, you know, I think how we approach the Bible is what a lot, I think, what modern Christians really need to spend their time on. Um, and I think this idea of a queering of theology is actually an invitation to us for us to think about how have we taken for granted how we interpret text? Um, and I think just the invitation to queer the text is an in invitation to rub up against what have we defined as normative approaches to scripture. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious, um, I see this comment that Rebecca put in about kind of an almost an obligation to engage folks uh, who may not have come to an inclusive faith or maybe coming out of a more um, exclusive or I would say more hierarchical faith system. What have you found to be some of the, the best approaches for you personally to open up a conversation to someone who may really come with a different hermeneutic than you about, about scripture? So, so, so for me personally, um, you know, I started out when I, when I first came out, I, I started out with a really optimistic view of my power to be able to convince people. <laughs> I thought I would just be able to tell my story and everyone in my little home church in Iowa would be like, oh, yeah, we did get this wrong. I'm so sorry. Uh, that's not what happened. Uh, and and I realized pretty quickly that the people get very worked up about these issues. And, and, and so where I started out really trying to engage and try to be able to argue point by point with people about you know, scripture and context and you know, all these things that we've been talking about, I, I started realizing that a lot of people you know, don't actually want to change the way they think. <laughs> they actually want to prove to you that the way they read scripture is the correct way and you are wrong. Um, so at this point in, in my work, I, I actually require people before I will even have a conversation with them about these things, because I'm willing to have a conversation. But, but I, I have three books that I give to people and say, read these books first. Um, if you read these three books, and, and I'm, I'm pretty particular about, you have to read all three. Um, then I'm willing to have a conversation because I, I want there to be some kind of buy-in. I, I want there to be some kind of sense of they are doing their own work. And then I'm, I'm happy to have that conversation. Um, a lot of people won't. 
that I've noticed. Like, like the people who are actually curious will be like, oh my gosh, thank you. I didn't know these were out there. And then we have beautiful conversations. But, but people who are just wanting to defend their own positions <laughs> usually won't read those three books. Um, it's a lot of reading. Um, that's how I approach it. Other people enjoy debates. Um, I am just not one of those people. So, yeah. <laughs> and what are those three books? Yeah. Yeah. So um, the first one is called Bible, Gender, Sexuality by Dr. James Brownson. Uh, he is a, a professor, was a professor at Western Seminary in, in Michigan. Um, and it, it, he takes a very conservative approach to scripture to argue for the possibility of LGBT relationships. And, and I really appreciate it because he's often on the same page as a lot of people who are coming into this conversation of how they approach scripture. So, so Bible, Gender, Sexuality by James Brownson. Uh, scripture, Ethics, and the Possibility of Same-Sex Relationships by Karen Keene. Uh, she's an, excuse me, she's an ethicist and, and theologian that, that adds in a lot of interesting things to the conversation. Um, and then the final book, I mean, we're actually going to be switching it up, is a book that's coming out later this year um, that's called Heavy Burdens uh, by Bridget Eileen Rivera. And I think it comes out in a couple months. But, but she talks about seven ways, and, and she's broken it down about seven ways, seven burdens that the modern church places on LGBTQ individuals. And she does a really good job of kind of breaking down uh, from both a scriptural approach, but also a historical and, and cultural approach of why as a church, we're placing undue burden on, on queer people. So th that book, Heavy Burdens, is, is one I would highly recommend as well. So, so those are the three. Yeah. We've got time for one more question. If someone has a burning question they'd like to offer or just a comment they'd like to make to Matthias at this time. Um, it seems to me that, that the, you mentioned the generationality of teenagers now growing up uh, being able to uh, see the, the queerness in everyone, really, um, and in themselves, and, and being uh, accepted in that regard. Uh, so that's uh, obviously dependent partly on where you live. Certainly, there are areas of the country where that is not the case. Uh, we live in one of the ones where it, it is more the case. and. Uh, in terms of people, uh, generations growing up enough that your parents are, uh, if you want to say liberal enough or open enough that they are not restricting that in you, then uh, you can begin uh, expressing it to others. So I, and I was considering the fact where my roommate and I have been watching a Canadian series, where it, which is in around the turn of the, the century, the last century, not this one, mm -hmm. um, where people were still incarcerated for being, if you could be proven to be homosexual, you would be sent to prison. So having come from there to the point we are now is what, about three or four generations, depending on how you count generations. Um, and how many generations will it take to get to the point that everybody is uh, free to express and be, uh, be who they are without either self-condemnation or societal condemnation? I realize you can't answer that, but there's, uh, there's a lot of exciting things going on, but it's going to take a while. That is the truth. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It, it, it's, been, it's been amazing to see what has even happened in the last 10 years. So I, I, I think some of my hope is that we're accelerating, but you know, we also see it's 
<laughs> living in the political environment that we're in, there are a lot of forces that are trying to stop the acceleration too. So I'm not quite sure how that will play out, but I, but I really, really hope that the wheel has started, you know, kind of rolling down the hill and that it won't be able to stop, that, that we'll get there quickly, hopefully. Um, and we all have a part to play in that. So. Well, we have been truly blessed by your presence and by your time with us. Uh, you've given us a lot to think about. This uh, Zoom has been recorded and I will make sure to put uh, content in it to point you to the three books that Matthias recommended so that you can get access to that. Um, we also have an incredible blessing that our next speaker for Theology Thursdays for next month, uh, Thursday, July 22nd, is actually on this call. Dr. Shirley Paulson will be talking about the secret revelation of John, a Gnostic text that was found in Nag Hammadi in 1945. And she'll be talking about what can we learn from this second century healing text? Is it Christian? Is it Gnostic? Is it something else entirely? And where can it help us to grow in our own faith in the modern context, putting it up against canonical texts that teach us about Jesus. What can we learn from the secret revelation of John? So please, if you've already registered for this, you're actually already registered for the next one. We just carry it over. So you'll get an email uh, in a minute that'll say, hey, you're registered. I've changed the content uh, and you'll be uh, meeting with Dr. Shirley Paulson. So again, this is a ministry of Admiral Congregational Church. We do this as a uh, free offering to the community because we want to continue to engage in intellectual and spiritual growth and development, not only for our congregation, but for the Pacific Northwest Conference of the United Church of Christ. And obviously beyond, we got folks coming in from the Bay Area. Sometimes we get folks from across the country. Um, uh, Dr. Paulson's calling in from uh, Chicago, I believe. Is that correct? Wonderful. So uh, again, it is uh, a great privilege and honor for us to host you, Matthias, for us to host you, Shirley, uh, next month um, and to do this work with you. So please go out there, take care of yourselves. Remember that uh, God made you beautiful, beautiful and beloved. And in our incompleteness is where we find the place that we intersect with one another, that we can be whole in Christ and in God and that the Holy Spirit is always working to knit us together into one people of love. So go forth to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with this God who is already, already walking with you and queer in the way. Amen. Oh, man. Great. Thank you, Matthias. Thanks, everybody. Thank you Bye -bye. all. Thanks for having me.